almost like being in a supermarket for reptiles. So there's just row upon row of shelves or boxes or tubs filled with exotic animals. The United States of America, a country famous for trendsetting and its influence on popular culture. However, over recent years, the USA has also become known as a global hotspot for the exotic pet industry. Recent estimates suggest that more than 17 million exotic pets are currently inhabiting American households. With one group of animals making up more than half the total, reptiles. Meeting up with World Animal Protection's global head of campaigns, Cassandra Conan, we headed to one of the many regional reptile expos occurring regularly across the country. Hopefully here we'd be able to find out exactly what was happening with pet reptiles in the USA. It's almost like being in a supermarket for reptiles. So there's just row upon row of shelves or boxes or tubs filled with exotic animals. Whilst there was an enormous variety of reptiles on display, one species was clearly much more popular than any other, the bull python. This is quite a bizarre experience. Your whole life, you're taught to keep away from snakes. And now suddenly I'm here at an expo in Memphis and there are a ton of people just walking around with snakes actually on their head. Speaking to a vendor, I got an insight into what drives the demand for bull pythons as pets. Do they mind being kept in these cases? Obviously the light to the people and everything, it's, it's probably a little stressful on them. But uh, I mean, I'm not in the snake's mind, I can't tell you how much it's bothering it. So why is that one so much more expensive than because these? It's, it's got two more genes in it. Uh, this is just a single gene here to where this has got three genes stacked on it. The more colorful, the more they're worth. Like if it's something that's brand new, you might be talking 20, 25K. And for, yeah. for a single snake? Yeah. And people will pay oh, that? Oh yeah, there's been, like the bananas, I think the first banana sold for 50K. Do you breed all these as well, or? I bred everything that's on the table, oh, except wow. this one's my new baby. This one here? Yes, but everything else here, or was here, I was bred at my house. Yeah. I to my house. Yeah. With information gathered and keen not to overstay our welcome, we called time on the expo. Later on, we had a chance to put what we had seen into perspective. How stressful do you think it would be for the snakes to be under these bright lights all day, to be constantly picked up by people, to have no access to food, no access to water? It would be extremely uh, stressful for, for them to be in those kinds of conditions. These animals are not being allowed to, to display their, um, their instincts, their natural instincts. They aren't in any kind of natural setting that allows them to fully extend, which is what they do when they eat. Um, doesn't allow them to explore. Um, there isn't uh, the proper, you know, enrichment. What was so fascinating was just how many different types of colors and patternings there were. And that was all on, from one species, just bull pythons. Part of this industry is this desire to have the most unique, the most interesting animal that has created this cottage industry where they are, you know, changing the genetics of these animals and breeding them to get unique colors, unique designs. If you look in films, you look in popular culture, snakes are always animals to be feared. Do you think that there is a perception that snakes aren't sentient beings? To most of us, they're not cute, they're not cuddly. Um, and so we assign a different value to them. They're really like products in a box. And is that how we want to be treating animals? And I would argue, no, that it's, it's time that we make a change and uh, that we allow animals to live the lives they deserve. All of the exhibitors that we spoke to yesterday, 
including this gentleman, said that they were breeding ball pythons. But do you know anything about the import of these snakes? There is still a very large market uh, for wild-caught snakes. If you go online, you're able to purchase them with no problem. So they may not have been for sale yesterday uh, when we were observing them, but it is entirely possible that the wild-caught snakes were part of that breeding process at some point. Whilst it was clear that pythons were being treated as a commodity, some questions still played on my mind. Where exactly did wild pythons fit into the picture? And what was life like for these snakes behind the scenes, away from the well-lit showcase put forward at the Expos? It was time to leave the US and take this investigation international. Travelling to the Czech Republic, I went to meet up with an old friend and exotic pet expert, Dr. Sid Notek, at the University of Brno. That looks painful. Yeah, it's very painful. The old skin has to go out and must be new skin, which takes weeks, sometimes even months. How did this snake sustain these injuries, do you think? It received the injuries from sitting on the stone, maybe a long time, and they received the burns of the belly. Why do you think that people generally don't think that snakes are sentient beings that have feelings or that feel pain. They don't produce any typical voice of pain. So we have to be very careful that many equipment in terror must be done that they will not receive any pain inside. So those are some of the problems then that snakes suffer from physically. But what about mentally? Do snakes, for example, get depressed? If they are depressed, they don't express even if they suffer mentally. Sometimes we only see the snake is not eating, but it's maximum that we know from the snake that the snake is not in good condition. It seems like you see quite a lot of bull pythons, yeah? Yeah, snakes. From snakes, bull pythons are one of the most common species that is kept in captivity. So where are they all coming from? Uh, it changed, because in history they were mainly from, really from nature. At first was the completely illegal market that was smuggled. And now many of these ball pythons, especially, especially these different color forms, are from captive for farming, for breeders. How do you think a snake's quality of life differs from captivity to living in the wild? Normal population of people know almost nothing about the snakes. They only know that they are carnivores, they are eating rats or mice, and they need temperature. This is maximum knowledge that we unfortunately still have. People aren't providing them with basic animal welfare. Yes, and people still don't think that they are sensitive and they suffer from bad conditions. This is very common, unfortunately. With the injured python receiving its much needed treatment, Sid made some phone calls and managed to set up a visit to a snake breeder's house in the center of the city. Entering the cramped apartment, we were met with snakes stacked in drawers and boxes from the floor to the ceiling. Oh my word. Well, I'm certainly no expert in this area. But I don't think it's too much to say that these snakes definitely don't have enough room. So what compels someone from Brno in the Czech Republic to want to breed exotic snakes? I started at the school school, and it was like that I was cool in general, or something, so I just made a rada, Because I wanted to spend some time with the sleep or something like that, and then I started with my horse, in fact, to develop. How much can you sell some of these different color morphs for? I think it's the highest price for them, it's just in those bars. And where do you actually get these snakes from? Wida, Benin, birthplace of voodoo and the natural habitat of wild bull pythons. Here in the centre of this small dusty town, I found a connection to the snakes stronger than anything I had seen before. 
So what's the history of this temple? Le piton est principalement vénéré à Ouida et un peu partout aussi dans le Bénin parce que c'est un serpent protecteur. C'est l'animal de la clairvoyance. C'est l'animal qui a ouvert les yeux à l'homme. Les gens, ici, le temple des pitons, c'est comme, un, comme une église, un temple vaudou, où les gens viennent se ressourcer, les gens viennent prier, les gens viennent chercher des bénédictions. And where did all the pythons come from? Ici, c'était une grande forêt. Mida, c'était de la forêt, c'était de la brousse. Le piton habitait ici depuis toujours. Le piton vit avec la population. La population vit avec le piton. C'est naturel. La plus grande partie des pitons, c'est dans les maisons chez les gens. Et quand les gens les trouvent chez eux, ils sont contents parce qu'ils se disent que c'est la divinité qui vient rendre visite. Pour eux, c'est les purification. I would like to show you some pictures now on, on my phone, if that's okay. Um, these images were taken at a reptile expo in America, and this is how people are selling pythons and taking care of them. Là, c'est. Ce que je peux dire, c'est que la, le, le, la divinité n'est pas dans son état naturel. Là, on le met dans des vivariums, on le met dans des, dans, dans des choses, ce n'est pas naturel. Or, ici, sa vie, naturellement, on, 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 on s'occupe de lui. If you ever have too many pythons here, what do you do with them? Parce que la divinité devient beaucoup plus beaucoup. C'est bien pour nous. Mais nous, on ne vend pas les pythons. Jamais. Le python, pour nous, c'est sacré. C'est notre divinité. On ne vend pas. Et quand on a beaucoup de pitons, ça veut dire que ça, ça se perpétue. C'est une bonne chose pour la population. Et jamais on ne vend le piton. So you're saying that the pythons here are revered, they're sacred animals. But does everyone in Benin and everyone throughout West Africa, do they all feel the same way? Vous savez un peu chez nous, c'est le piton est vénéré chez nous. Mais ailleurs, par exemple, ceux qui ne vénèrent pas le piton, ils peuvent le faire du mal. Dans les marchés, on sait très bien que les gens font des trafics et ils vendent des pitons. Mais ils savent très bien qu'ils couvrent un grand risque parce que c'est une divinité. Following the python priest's lead, I went to investigate the markets on the outskirts of town. Despite covering stories on human wildlife trade for more than a decade, nothing could prepare me for what I was about to find. Oh my soul. I have never seen anything like this. We've got baboon head, catfish, dog, crocodile. Oh my word, that is a bucket of monkey heads there. No animal seemed to be off limits, all dried and on sale for use in voodoo practices. Just about every type of animal you can possibly imagine. We've even got live animals here, tortoises. Inevitably, our presence and cameras started to cause some problems. But just as we were on our way out, we came across a shocking sight. And here we have an entire tray of bull python heads. Perhaps these animals aren't quite as revered here as I thought they were. Between the snake's apparent sacred status at the temple and the discovery of dried pythons at the market, it still wasn't clear who was supplying these animals to the exotic pet industry. Desperate to find a new lead, I went online to get some answers. According to World Animal Protection Research, of all the pythons traded internationally, almost all of them come from only three countries in Africa. The biggest exporter, Ghana. Arriving into Accra, I went to meet up with Edith Kabasimi of World Animal Protection, who could hopefully shed some light on the python trade networks. Edith, what can you tell me about the python situation here in Ghana? So, over the last 40 years, uh, we are talking of over 3 million ball pythons having been exported from West Africa to the rest of the world. The majority of these go to the US. And if you look at the CITES database, uh, ball pythons are the most single most traded live animals from Africa. So how are the snakes making it out of Africa and then all over the world and in such large numbers? In order to export these sorts of numbers and consistently, you've got to be very organized. So what happens is that uh, there are several 
uh, ball python farms, hunters or collectors go out in the wild and collect pregnant female pythons and bring them to the ranches. They keep them until they, they lay the eggs and then they lay the eggs hatch. All the mothers are supposed to be taken back into the wild with 10% of the of the babies but as to whether that happens i mean i have no idea there are question marks there showing me imagery sent anonymously to world animal protection edith then revealed the state that some of the animals were held in inside these ranches conditions like this are a breeding ground for zoonotic diseases and clearly the ranches were targeting more than just pythons i had to witness this for myself Heading to the outskirts of the city, I went to meet up with the only rancher who was willing to speak to me. How many bull pythons do you have at the moment? Four. Four snakes, four yes. bull pythons in total or four pregnant ones? No, four, three pregnant ones and one male. And where do all the snakes come from? So do you have like a team of people collecting them? Yes, yes. We have, uh, let, me, let me call them trappers. Let me call them trappers, okay? Those who are trained by our wildlife division, okay, and they are given permits, license to trap in specific areas. What do you do when they've laid the eggs? We get, put them together and incubate them. And then when they've hatched? Then we shoot the babies out. <laughs> <laughs> and how many snakes might you get then when it's breeding season? If you're able to collect a total of, let's say, 500 of this, then you're looking at 3,000, 3,500 babies. <laughs> are all of them then shipped out? No, you have to, we are, we'll be releasing 10% of the total hatching back into the world, the locations where the mothers were collected. And not, not only these ball pythons, we ranch other species too. In the past, we, we knew that these ball pythons, the yeah. locations were very expensive when they were coming out of first. But now they have bred, they have bred different kinds of mutations that, that can even not be found in the world. Once in a while, you come across the same ball python, but a white color, very cystic. In the past, those ones were very expensive. So if you came across a snake with a really interesting mutation, what would you do? You just show it to your, your customer if he's interested, you sell it that. <laughs> Can you tell me how much they, they oh, might be worth? Oh, I know in the past, some of them were over $1,000 per head. And if you sell them to someone's say for example in America, okay. do you then worry that they might not take care of your animal in the same way that you might? We know that most of them go into pets, the pet okay. trade. Okay. And if you follow the pet trade on the internet, you see how people really also admire them. With the farms confirming the collection of wild pythons for ranching to supply the international exotic pet trade, one question remained. How exactly were these pregnant snakes really being taken from the wild? Meeting up again with Edith, she pointed me in the direction of the known major python collection areas and a nearby community of hunters. How are you? Yeah, good to meet you. So this is your home? Yeah. It's like a, it's like a small zoo. Yeah. <laughs> so many animals. I'm trying to play count the species here. You can see horse, camel, cows, dogs, goats. Is that a lizard in the cage? Yeah, lizard. What other animals do you catch when you're hunting? Any, any, any animal. Oh. Uh, yeah, they, yeah, they're civets. How did you catch these? Go hunting them. We see them, them, uh, as their mother. Then their mother want to run, they will shoot them. Then we catch the babies. So you killed the mother, yeah. and then you got the the, ba the babies. And what about uh, bull pythons? Mm, when we are going to the bush, we have a group we are going. So when we go to the bush inside, maybe everybody they pass away, we used to have to go. And how many people? Sometimes we go 15 people, sometimes five, sometimes we do about 100 people. Seeing the amount of hunters and the amount of dogs there are, 
you've got to wonder how any wildlife actually stands a chance. The hunt the animals because of their fight, only the pattern with the food. They hunt the uh, bush animals. Well, this is definitely not what I was expecting so far. We're in the middle of what seems like a housing estate and a plantation. I don't know whether we're going to head out more over there into which looks like more forested area. Like when we see the python, then small people, some go go in them. Can you tell what it is from the smell? Uh, yeah, you can tell. Oh, it's gone. It's gone this way. So now we're going to follow it and see if they see if they find the snake. Okay, so that's its tracks right there. I know it's in, in the burrow. That is, uh, that's definitely a ball python. Uh, and the guys are primarily looking for ball pythons. Uh, they said that they will also catch whatever they can come across, whether it's antelope or, or pangolin, pretty much any other animals. Um, and then they can sell the ball pythons for as much as $1,000 per animal. And with that, it suddenly became clear how a wild bull python can end up as a pet in North America. As my journey across the world comes to a close, it's hard not to feel for what many people consider to be a villainous creature. Snakes may not be cute and cuddly, but does that really make their suffering any less relevant? Take ball pythons as an example. They're either born into a life of misery, or they're pulled from the wild, exploited, and transported there. And the driving force behind all of this? Us, the consumers. I believe that wild animals belong in the wild. Uh, these animals are not domesticated. Um, and there is no environment that we could create for them, even with our best intentions, even with the best care possible, that would allow them to live the life that they are naturally born to live.